excited that, and, and I took a little bit of time to do this, those are names written down on white stones. And, and I'm firmly convinced that somewhere in heaven right now, I, I don't think the stones are just laying by creek banks here or there. I believe God has them all gathered up, ready to hand out, that somewhere in the confines of heaven right now, if you are faithfully following Jesus Christ, it's your new name, not your old name, but your new name is written down somewhere in glory this morning, just like what you see there. It's a name that you don't know, it's a name that you don't understand, but I'm going to try to help you this morning understand that if you will grasp a hold of it, you can be an overcomer in Jesus Christ. That's what we're here for, that's what this whole series has been about, is trying to overcome. And friend, I'm telling you this morning that if you will simply overcome, that you can have a new name, that all the tags that the world has put on you, that whatever everybody has called you throughout your life, no matter, no, does not matter anymore, but simply what God calls you is what matters. We're going to look at Revelation chapter 2. We're continuing there this morning. We're going to be on the letter to the church at Pergamos, which is uh, verses 12 through 17. And if you're able to stand for that length of time, I'm going to read that entire short letter. It says to the angel of the church in Pergamos, write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works and where thou dwellest. Even where Satan's seat is, thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there that hold there hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. If God hates something, who knows we ought not hold on to it. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. But especially verse 17, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith, catch this, not unto the church at Pergamos, but the Spirit saith unto the churches, including us. You get that? To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone. And in the stone, a new name written. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All you have to do is overcome, and he will give you a name which no man knoweth, saving you that receive it. Heavenly Father, just simply be with us today. That's all I ask. Lord, let us encounter you. Let us understand what it means to overcome. God, let us quit living in what we live in and start living in what you have for us. Empower us, equip us, move us forward, God, into what you have. Not so that we can be glorified, not so that we can live comfortable, but God, so that we can glorify you and one day live with you for an eternity in heaven. God, help us to overcome so that we can get a hold of our new name. Lord, let us see, let us understand, let your Spirit guide us today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Now there's a ton of information I'm going to try to not take all day because I just want to get to the point and I want to see the Spirit move and the Spirit work. But we are on part four of Overcomers and to lay a little bit of groundwork to bring you up to where we were at, I started out with the power of promise and, and how it's important to understand that the one that is making the promise to us is simply all-powerful. He is the one that cannot fail. He is the one that cannot lie. It is God alone that holds the power of these promises to us. We move from there to 
We have a paradise waiting in Ephesus. Although they had lost their first love, he had made a way for them to be reconciled and he called them back to a love of, of him and of people. Last week we talked about a way of escape out of the fire. We talked about the church at Smyrna. And even though that things are really quite difficult sometimes around us, God has made a way of escape for us. And thank God for it. And each of those rest back on the promise maker because he is the only one that cannot fail. But one constant that we have throughout the letters is that each promise is to one that overcomes. A friend, that means you can't keep sitting where you're at. That means you have to fight against something. It means you have somewhere to walk to. You have something that you have to overcome in your life. Each promise made is by the only one that never changes, varies, or fails. And in fact, we're going to see today that the promise today rests back on one that has a sharp, two-edged sword. Now that should be frightful to most of us, though I feel like if we updated the language to modern terms, it would be something along the lines of one that has missiles or something like that. But what you don't understand is a missile obliterates, but when you take a sword, you can do some more surgical precision. And I've got a verse that shows that God can do things with that word and that sword that no man can accomplish. In other words, what this series is designed for and what I believe God has laid on my heart and what I've been preaching is that we need a group of people that are community-impacting world changers that overcome. I don't need you to just overcome in your life, but I do need you to overcome that. I need you to overcome your sin, your presuppositions, and all the things that are going on. But I also need you to be able to overcome the world. That way, when you encounter the next person that comes down the street, you can explain to them exactly how you did it. Because if you just tell them you need to quit, but you can't tell them how, you have no credibility and they're just going to go on about their business. You've not helped them. I need people that have overcome. I need people that are willing to not just talk the talk, but also walk the walk. But you also need to take as many with you as you can. You don't need to walk it in isolation. You don't need to walk it alone. You need to walk it out and try to make heaven crowded. You know what an overcomer is? I've talked about overcomer, but I don't know that I've actually sat down and tried to define the word. So I took time to look it up, and it's defined as this. The first part of it is okay, I guess, a person who overcomes something. That's pretty common sense. If you can't figure that out, I'm probably not the one to help you this morning. But I do like the second part of it, and that's what I want to get at. One who succeeds in dealing with or gaining control of some problem or difficulty. An overcomer is someone that looks at a problem and can effectively deal with it or gain control of that problem effectively. This world is full of problems. My goodness, all you got to do is turn on the, the news right now or open up an internet browser and go to any given news uh, site and you're going to see problems not just in the U.S., but you're going to see problems throughout the world. You're going to see problems in Israel, in the Middle East. You're going to see problems in Russia and you're going to see problems in Ukraine and you're going to see economic problems around the world. You're going to see countries that are struggling just to be able to help their people make ends meet. We've got a world plumb full of problems, but we don't look at those so much because when we look in our own life, life, we are again in a place where we are full of troubles. We have people that have difficulty figuring out which bill to pay this week and which one they can put off until next week because finances are tight and prices have went up exponentially. I don't care what percentage they put on inflation. I know real world is something that costs a dollar 
four years ago now cost four and five dollars. Something that cost four dollars four years ago now cost ten dollars. It is a very high inflation rate and people's wages have not went up to match so we have problems financially. We've got people that have tried to live right throughout their life and do the right thing over and over again and yet everything around them keeps crashing in. Their children cause them problems. Their brothers, their sisters are against them and in some cases even their parents don't want anything to do with them we've got a world full of problems we've got people that were born into addiction and they struggle every day to overcome it through no fault of their own we've got a world full of problems and we don't know how to deal with them within our self but I'm here to tell you that there is one that can help you overcome See, Ephesus had lost their first love, and I'm going to come back to, to what I was talking about. Ephesus had lost their first love. They loved doctrine, but not people. We come here to, to this church, and we've got an opposite problem. We've got a church that love people and love culture and love taking part in everything that's around them, but they lost their love for doctrine. That's the problem we have, I believe, in the church and in the world today. We cannot find our balance between doctrine and people. We're either all Ephesus, we want doctrine and we don't want nothing to do with the people that we don't want to be around, or we're all Pergamos, we want everything of culture, it's okay to partake in everything that is around us, and that is a lie from the pits of hell. We cannot lose our doctrine, we cannot abandon who we are, we cannot abandon the one that saved us, we have to hold firm to our doctrine. Amen. But that's a problem, we can't find balance. We've lost the meanings of words and we've applied a modern understanding to an ancient call. God called us to be sanctified, holy people. And we try to apply modern terms to that, that we have to have affectionate feelings for everyone and everything. That we have to love everything that goes on. And that's just simply not the case. That's not the only problem. Let's be realistic. We've got some that truly try to walk that balance between loving people and, and loving God fully because that is the two greatest commandments. On that, you can hang all the law and all the prophets, right? It is to love God and to love people. But now I believe that order is important. It is important for us first to love God above all else. We love people secondly. Why? Because you can't love someone right if you don't love God first. You must dedicate your life to God first before you can dedicate your life to someone else. But even when you do that and you walk around out in the world, you get inundated at every turn with temptation today. And you can say I'm over-dramatizing uh, things. Joni accuses me of being dramatic all the time, and, and maybe I am just a little bit. But I'm telling you, all around the world, every step you take, you are going to be hit with temptation. You can turn on the radio and hear an ad, and you will be tempted. You can drive down the road and look at a billboard, and you will be tempted. You can go sit in your home and open a magazine that was mailed to you and be tempted. Temptation in a us it besieges us at every turn and let's be honest some of us have problem with sin maybe not a sin unto death but we've got something in our life that if we let it keep festering and we don't overcome it instead we become a slave to it it's going to keep us out of heaven we have these problems with false religions bombarding us day in and day out You've got all kinds of religions around the world. There's only one true religion. But we get bombarded that somehow we can integrate and, and, and make nice with these various religions, Muslims and, and others. They, they cannot cohabitate. They cannot coexist. I don't care what the bumper sticker says. I cannot coexist with Hinduism. I cannot 
coexist with Rastafarianism. I cannot coexist with Islam. I have to proclaim that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world, that it is only through the blood of Christ that you can be reconciled to God because Jesus Christ himself said in John 14 and 6 that I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man goes to the Father except through him. And he went to the cross for that and died for it. I cannot coexist with something else. Life just seems to never cease with difficulties. I don't tell you that to beat you down. I I tell you that to give you a a dose of realism. Look, I understand that God is all-powerful and He can fix every problem that that is in our life. But He did not promise you to fix it while you're on this earth. But what He promised you is an eternity in heaven where He will wipe away every tear that you've cried on this earth, that you will go to a heaven where you will be perfect, where you have access to the tree of life. He didn't promise it was going to be easy here. But what He told you is that every turn here, you're going to be tempted but you're going to be tempted in every manner as is common to man and every time that he has temptation that circles you he is going to make a way of escape for you if you will simply turn around and walk away from it I have come this morning to tell you that you are an overcomer that these things that are around you you can take care of and he has told us how these things that are bearing down on you you can walk over top of and make your path towards heaven instead of dwelling in sin and problems and all of your feelings that we like to stay in. God did not design you to fail. God did not design you to fail, or let me rephrase that, God did not design you for hell. Hell was made for Satan and his angels that fell with him. He did not make you to go to hell. He did not make ways of oppression to keep you trapped. But he did make a way of escape, a way to overcome the temptation and sin, and that way is simply the blood of Jesus Christ. All that was preliminary. Now I'm getting to the text. To the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. Do you understand who's telling you these things this morning? It, it, it's none other than Jesus Christ. If we go back, he's the one that walketh in the midst of the seven, candon, uh, seven golden candlesticks that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand. Can you imagine how big Jesus really is outside of his earthly body if he can hold seven stars that are light years apart in one hand? We, we don't ever stop to think about that. We, we look at that and we think it's just painting a picture, which it is. It's talking about the seven churches and the seven angels that they're in his right hand, his hand of power, his hand of control. But I believe it is also very literal because the universe is meted out in the span of his hand. From star to star, there's not enough time in history to be able to go from one to the other, and yet Jesus just holds it in the palm of his hand. That's the same one that is talking that saith these things which is the first and the last which was dead and is alive. He is also the one that has the authority and the power to carry this sharp two-edged sword. For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. You know, I talk about maybe modern times would be a missile or something like that, right? But in the Bible, we understand what a two-edged sword is. It piercing to the division of the soul and the spirit. Something man can't separate. There's no way that we can differentiate between soul and spirit in a man. We can try analogies, we can try science, we can try all of these different things, and it's going to fail. It's an impossibility for man to discern the two and to separate the two. But this sword that this one speaking to the church in Pergamos has in his hand is able to do what no man on earth has ever been able to accomplish. To divide the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow. But I love the very end of it. The discerning of the thoughts and the intentions of our heart. 
You see, God knows everything that's going on within our minds and our hearts. I know so many times we will look at things going on and we think people have different motives for what they're doing. And I'm not naive. I know some people do things to be noticed and to be seen and all of these different things. But can I tell you, we get it wrong more often than we get it right. The closer you get to people, the more you understand. And we typically sit in what we talked about Wednesday night, our cynicism. And, and we sit in our own little myopic chambers where we can only see what's going on within ourselves, and we get it wrong but can I tell you whatever you've done if your heart's pure and and your mind is set on Christ and I'm not talking about sin so don't take that out of context but if you're pressing forward for the high mark the calling in Christ Jesus that he has set before us if you're pressing forward to make the kingdom crowded he knows your heart he knows your thoughts he knows what you are pressing towards don't listen to what other people are saying about you don't listen to the label that people have put on you don't worry about how many people are going to kick back against it if you're doing what you know in your heart to be right for the kingdom of God and it lines up with the word of God then you go ahead and press on brother sister you keep walking to do what God has called you to do because if you don't you will not overcome but if you keep looking to Jesus you can step over all of the problems of the world if you keep walking to Jesus you can keep stepping over what people have called you what people have done to you all of the things that are thrown in your way as a stumbling block you can use it as a stepping stone and a ladder to get to Jesus Christ and that word comes from Jesus how do I know that he's the word of God in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God the same was in the beginning with God all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made That is the one that is telling us the promise in these next verses. You get down to verse 13, it says, I know thy works where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith. Even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. I preached last week that the devil has no authority over your eternal soul. Or over you at all, really. He does dwell among us. We don't like to think of that. He doesn't have a lot of need to be residing in hell right now. He's going to be locked there for a thousand years. He knows his fate. He knows the end of the book. He knows the Bible better than you do. He was there from the very beginning of the world when it was written. He dwells among us. He is here on this earth even right now. And he has one goal. He has one intent. He has one thing he's trying to accomplish. And that is to make you fail. Now I could go through here and call you name by name and tell you, Mary, his goal is to make you fail. Angel, his goal is to make you fail. Aaron, his goal is to make you fail. We can go name by name, person by person. That is the only reason he is here. Jesus knows the place that we are at. He knows the difficulties that we face. We try to put all kinds of different things on this. We, some people will look at that and say, well, Pergamos was the seat of Satan where he lived at. I, I don't think that to be the case. They say that because that's where Antipas was m- martyred, but he was not the first martyr. If we take martyrdom as a, as a sign that that's where Satan lives and Satan also lives at Jerusalem because that's where the first martyr was at in Stephen. So I don't know exactly what they're saying other than that this is a really, really bad place here at Pergamos. That Satan is running rampant. They've got polytheism all around. In other words, they're worshiping this God. They're worshiping that God. They've got temples to every thing under the sun. We know from Acts 17, I believe it is, Paul went to Athens and he went through and he said, you know, you've got this God and you've got this God, but I've come to tell you about this statue. You've even got a statue to an unknown God. Pergamos was the same way, but there they were also killing Christians. It was an ungodly place at best. 
but probably a little worse than others for Jesus to look down and, and say that this is the seat of Satan. I would probably liken that to today's world of looking at the United States and, and we're a, probably a pretty good place to worship. Generally speaking, you're not going to have any difficulties here. But if you go somewhere where other religions are prevalent, it becomes much more difficult to worship. Because I know I've been to some of these places, and Aaron and, and Stanley have been to some of these places, where you have armed guards to keep you from place to place just to be able to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Those would be a seat of Satan. You come here and it's free reign to do what you want. And isn't it so ironic? And let me go off, off my notes for a minute that you get into places like that and, and don't just take my word for it. Grab Aaron or, or grab Stanley and ask them how worship is in those places. It is so much more enthusiastic and energetic and sincere and heartfelt. And you may not understand a word that they are saying, but thanks be to God that through the power of the Holy Ghost, you can feel what they are worshiping. And they will worship for hours and hours. My last time over into Pakistan, I would go, it was supposed to start at 7, I would end up in the local pastor's house at 7, we would have a meal, we would fellowship, we wouldn't even get to where I was preaching until 8.30 or 9 o'clock, and they were just getting wound up, and they had been worshiping for two hours before I got there. They would worship another 30, 40 minutes after I walked in, then I would preach, and then I would pray for every person there. I prayed for everyone that was in the church, everyone that was in the compound outside of the church, and in some cases, they come back through the line a second time. They will wear you out with their enthusiasm because they look around and we think we've got temptation and sin and all these things, and we do, but it's not like theirs. Their only reliance is on God Almighty. Let me get back on track. Ungodly places exist in this world, and we have it here, just not as bad. And to be clear, Christ is building them up a little bit. He's saying, I know where you are at. I know that temptation abounds, that sin is around you, that there are difficulties that you're facing, and you are holding fast to the faith. You understand and know that my son died on the cross. And that it is He that is providing this message. But, how many people do we have sitting in churches, church of God included, not excluded, all around the world of all varying denominations that sit in the church that know the faith of Christ, but God has something against us. I have a few things against thee because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Most of you probably remember Balaam because of Balaam's donkey. That's a popular story. You learn it in Sunday school as a kid, and we probably never go much more than that on it. I think maybe I've preached it one time in about 15 years or so. Maybe. Maybe not that. But do you understand that Balaam made an accurate prophecy? If you go back into Numbers chapter 24, and, and I'll just read you exactly what he wrote there. I shall, he, he has said, which heard the words of God and knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the vision of the Almighty falling into a trance and having his eyes open, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Sheth. And Edom shall be a possession, Seir also shall be a possession for his enemies, and Israel shall do valiantly. Out of Jacob shall come he that shall have dominion, and shall destroy him that remaineth of the city. Now what does that sound like? That is a true and accurate prophecy, is it not? That is a prophecy of Jesus Christ. That is a prophecy of the one to come. But if you keep reading a little bit, you also see that Balaam was instrumental in helping Israel take part in sexual immorality and worship of Baal. 
This one that made this good and accurate prophecy that Jesus Christ was going to come, that heard from God on Sunday, walked out on Monday and helped Israel fall. We have trouble reconciling all of this, don't we? You know why we have trouble reconciling it? Because we're living it. And when it's right in front of you, you have so much difficulty seeing the forest because you've got a tree right in front of you. That is very much what we have going on in the world today. I believe we are at a place like Pergamos. We are embracing Balaam. We're embracing someone that said one word right and then they do 15 things wrong and we keep overlooking it time after time after time. We have people that have positive sides and negative sides and we tend to overlook the negative for the good of the positive. Balaam ultimately within the religious sect become proverbial for a false teacher. Even a blind hog roots out an acre and every once in a while, right? But boy, when that blind hog roots one out, we grab a hold of them and we will ride them to the finish line. And then when they make 15 other false prophecies and have sin abounding out of their life, we just overlook it and sweep it under the rug. Friend, we cannot do that. God has called us to repent. But I'll get to that. Balaam become proverbial for false teachers who, for money, influences believers to enter into relationships of compromising unfaithfulness. He's warned by God to stop and he finally gets punished. You want to put that in modern day terms? We sell God for cheap sensationalism, for followers, and for popularity. I know God discerns the heart, the thoughts, and there's a lot of things that you can do is neither biblically wrong or right. It's just something to do to try to reach people for Christ. God knows your hearts and your thoughts. Are you doing it for popularity or are you doing it to make heaven crowded? We need to make sure our heart's right because that is really what matters. But can I also tell you this? You keep reading in that verse. And, and it's not just that uh, this doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast stumbling stones before the children of Israel. I told you that our enemy is out to make us fail. That is his one goal. Satan has one goal and that's to make us stumble. But this verse goes on to talk about eating things sacrificed to idols. Can I, let, let me just put it to you this way. That was a real problem. They would take uh, stuff into the temple, not the, the godly temple, but the temple of these other fake gods, the Greco-Roman gods, and they would sacrifice it knowing that it was to gods. And then they would purposely go and try to make stumbling blocks out of it and give it to the Christians to eat. And, and some of them would refuse it because they knew where it had come from and others didn't really care where it had come from and they would just try to eat it but they they tried to integrate that and make excuses for this and I don't think it was a matter of food because we've got too many other Bible verses that say that you can just pray over whatever and it'll be okay you know we got Acts chapter 10 we've got some verses in Mark and some other places here's what I believe it was it, it was syncretism at its finest they were trying to find a way that they could worship all of the gods that were around them and then also still go into the temple of God and worship him also what God is telling them is you cannot partake of the world you can't eat the same diet the world eats you can't live the same way the world lives you can't do the same activities that the world does rather you must come out you must be set apart you must be sanctified you must be separate you've got to be someone different than what the world is or you are not going to make it to heaven you cannot walk the way of Balaam and enjoy the throne of God and, and commit fornication. I, look, time and time again, we focus on the wrong things. Yes, abortion is wrong, but so is murder. But we will only call out one and we'll overlook the other. 
Yes, the LGBTQ plus and all the rest of the alphabet that they throw with it is absolutely sinful behavior. But you know what? So is shacking up. So is going over to your neighbor's spouse. When they walk out, you walk in the other door. So is having sex outside of marriage. I don't care whether you're male, female, or whatever you call yourself. doesn't really matter if it's outside the confines of a God-given marriage between man and woman. It is fornication. But we will only zero in on one and he is equally clear that we cannot partake of that sin of the world also fornicators will have no part in the kingdom of heaven quit singling out one sin and sweeping another under the rug because that is exactly what Pergamos was doing as a church they were trying to sweep sin under the rug because they wanted to be integrated with the world yes I want to reach the world yes I want to be able to tell the world about Jesus but I can't do it at the cost of our doctrine I can't do it at the cost of the blood of Christ we have to cling tightly to what he has given us a true doctrine of loving God above all else and then loving people as we can to bring them to the cross but not to show them that we can integrate with them I get tired of hearing Jesus eat with sinners yes he eat with sinners but then he left and he got back among his circle how do I know this and and I'm going to skip a verse just for the sake of time but also I believe the Nicolaitans were the same as the rest that he was talking about we really can't nailed down a doctrine but when you get to verse 16 he's saying you've been eating with all these people you've been doing all these things you shouldn't do you've been in places you shouldn't be and you've been living a life that you shouldn't live and he goes to verse 16 and the very first word out of his mouth is repent I shared a thing on Facebook some of you may have seen it and I don't remember how it was but uh, you may have Uh, went to the altar but did you change you may have shouted but did you repent or something like that we've got a lot of that that goes on we don't even know what repenting is we think of repentance is coming to the altar and saying God I'm sorry forgive me and then we can get up and we can go do whatever we want to do but that is not repentance that is not what God has called us to do number one he has called you if you are a saved sanctified Holy Ghost filled believer or even just saved and you're not even fully sanctified yet he, here's what he's called you to do submit yourselves therefore to God resist the devil and he will flee from you that's how you overcome that's exactly how you overcome but for those that have not given their life to Christ he says repent and let me give you a very clear definition of repentance it's not coming to an altar and laying down and and shedding some fake tears don't tell me you can't do it come up here grab a hold of a nose hair and pull it real good and you'll have tears Yeah, I know some of you secrets. I don't know that anybody here does that. But I know that it works. But they'll, you, tell me people don't do it. They'll come up and they'll boohoo around and they'll waller around for two or three minutes and they'll carry on and wail and act like something really going on with them and then you see them on Monday morning and they're right back to the same old thing. They've got the same countenance about them and you'll be looking and you'll say, well, my goodness, I thought God touched them last night. No, a pair of tweezers did when it jerked the hair out. Repent. Repent. Have a change of self change of heart and mind that abandons former dispositions. Let me bust some of your bubble. And I've said it myself, so I'm kind of talking to me also. We need to come into His courts with thanksgiving and into His gates with praise, right? We need to enter into the house. And we tell people, just leave whatever's bothering you outside. Don't bring it in here, just leave it outside. Well, what do you want them to do? Pick it up when they walk out? My goodness, we need him to bring it in. I need you to bring in your baggage when you come into the church. I need, to bring, I need you to bring your terrible disposition. I need you to bring your bag of drugs. I need you to bring your bottle of liquor. I need you to bring in your pack of cigarettes. I need you to bring in whatever your problem is. Why? Because if it's out there, it's going to grab you when you walk back out the doors. But if you will bring it in and repent, 
do a biblical model of repentance and what you do is you bring it to the altar and you leave it at God's feet and you abandon it. You walk away from it. The wallowing is all for show. The crying's all for show. But you come in and you repent. You have a change of self that abandons former dispositions and results in a new self. You cannot be new if you leave your problems out there and walk back out and pick them up. Results in a new self, new behavior, and regret over former behavior and dispositions. You know when you ought to waller and wail and cry? When you get home. I don't have a problem with it here. I mean, I think it's good that people weep before the Lord. But really, when you ought to really wail and weep and cry is when you get home and you start realizing and you look around your house and things start triggering your memory and you realize all the terrible things that you've done and said about God and to God and to others over the years. And, and then you go back to the altar that you set up in your home and you weep and wail and cry because you realize now that you're in the love of God how bad you've hurt Him time after time. Talked about that sharp two-edged sword. I've still got one more verse to go, but I, I can't skip this. The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. That's Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. But we have to know how to overcome. I don't want to just tell you that you are overcomers. I don't want to just tell you that you can overcome. I give you the one from James you need to resist. God's not just going to miraculously make it disappear from you. I mean, He might. The deliverance is a thing. Me and Aaron's talked about that. Some need deliverance because you can't leave it alone because you've been with something so long it has fundamentally changed the chemical makeup of what God designed you have destroyed and you really need deliverance to fix it. But most often you just need to leave it alone. You need to have some power within yourself. Verses 13 through 16 in Hebrews chapter 4 says, No creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. There is nothing you will ever hide from God. Ever. Friend, if you want to be an overcomer, God has already seen it. You need to confess it to Him. You need to bring it and lay it on the altar. Don't, if you left something back there at the back door, get up and go pick it up and bring it up here. He already seen it. Whether you left it out there or whether you brought it in here, He's already seen it. Whether you left it at home or brought it here, He's already seen it. Me and Joni's done this before. When our kids were smaller, we'd fuss and fight and argue and have to beat the kids half to death on the way to church and everything else. And then you get to the church house and you step out and you have to put on the pretty smile. You have to walk in and you have to act like everything is good. No, it ain't. You just had to beat the brakes off your kid. I've done it. I've done it. And then we leave it out there. God knows it. We come in here like God ain't seen nothing. What God do we serve if He didn't see that? If He didn't see us driving in our car and the way we were acting on the way to church, we don't even need to come to church because He's not a God at all. Now let me go on. I'll keep you all here to 3 o'clock. Since then we have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness. Do you think Jesus wasn't tempted when He walked the earth? How bad do you think His brothers got on His nerves sometimes? Even His parents, when they went back to drag Him out of the temple when He was 12 years old, and he was at that point where he knew that his father was God. But here comes us Mary and Joseph to try to drag him away from what he knew he was supposed to be doing. How frustrated do you think he got? How upset do you think he was when he had to kneel down and wash the feet of Judas who was getting ready to go betray him? Do you think he was tempted to go ahead and do something about it at that point? I know he was. He prayed to God, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. 
How do you think he felt standing by the tomb of Lazarus? When, when it says Jesus wept, I think it was for two different reasons. One, it was their lack of faith, but two, I believe he had a, a genuine and sincere, deep, heartfelt hurt because his friend had suffered a death that he had come to conquer and to overcome. Jesus has been through everything that you're going to go through. Everything. He has been, te been tempted in every manner that you will be tempted. But one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. You can only overcome by the blood of Jesus Christ. You can only overcome by getting to the one that has already been down that road and knows how to do it. Jesus knows how to do it. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. That is how to overcome. Quit partaking of the worldly food. Quit doing the things that the world tells you to do. Get at the feet of Jesus Christ that has already conquered the world, death, hell, and the grave and has made a way of reconciliation for us. Draw near to Christ to overcome. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna. Friend, you cannot partake of the world and eat what God has for you. You cannot partake of the things of the world and eat from the hand of God at the same time. And, when you quit eating from the world, when you get at the feet of Christ and you start eating what He has for you, He is the bread of life, and if He is the Word, this is the very first thing we need to do day in and day out. I believe that's our hidden manna. We'll give Him a white stone. White stone. I told you, I believe at the very beginning, I believe that right now in heaven, somewhere near the throne, is a neatly stacked group of stones. I, I can't prove that biblically. It's just what I see in my mind. I know He's got them. That's biblical. I know they've got names written on them. That's biblical. I know they're white. That's biblical. And it's something He can grab and give to us like pulling blocks out of a wall with a new name written that no one understands. I would be willing to bet that there's no one in here other than me and I can only read about half of them that can read any of those names. If you can, God bless you, help me out a little bit. I can take my time and read them. But for you looking at those, that's, that's what's going on right now. There's a name written in heaven that unless you're at the feet of Christ... Unless you've grabbed a hold of Him firmly and you're refusing to let go, you don't know what He's called you to. You don't know what He's calling you into. And you don't know the name that He has for you. All you know is the name that the world has called you time and time again. They've called you mean. They've called you hateful. They've called you addict. They've called you fornicator. They've called you adulterer. They've called you alcoholic. They've called you all of these different things. Some of you they might have called church hopper, some of you they might have called Pharisee, some of you they might have called Sadducee, some of you they might have called like they called me for a lot of years just a heathen. People keep calling you that over and over, guess what you tend to do? You tend to act it out. <coughs> you tend to follow along what it is. But that white stone has power. God said you don't have to keep going by what the world has called you, by what everybody else has told you to do, by what they're trying to pull you into. He has a new name written down in glory for you today. When he says he's given a white stone, what he's talking about is favorable judgment. Favorable judgment. You want to know what favorable judgment is? The word for stone is kephas. Peter? Upon this rock will I build my church upon his confession? 
Peter found favorable judgment even through his sin, even through his rebellion, even through all of his acts. God looked at him and pronounced favorable judgment upon him. But what those stones were, they were also a way of voting in antiquity. And a white stone was a positive vote or a yes vote. In other words, when you enter the confines of heaven and and Jesus is standing there and He reaches a white stone to you, what He is doing is giving you a favorable vote. He's giving you favor and saying, yes, this is a positive thing. It was also proverbial for a fortune. But a white stone also meant that a person conquered or was vindicated in court. The devil's on the other side of the courtroom right now and he's making accusations against every one of you. But on the other side of the courtroom, here we sit at the defendant's table. The plaintiff is over there. He's made his argument. Jesus is standing in front of us as judge. And he has to say nothing. But all he has to simply do is reach out a conquering stone and when you get that stone it's going to have a name that no one in this world has ever called you and it's going to be your final vindication from everything that's been done it's going to be your final victory it is going to be your favorable vote from God I want to ask you this morning are you living the life that he has called you to live Or are you like those in Pergamos that you're trying to live the way of the world and also the way of the church? Now there's no shame in this. There's shame in in not making it right with God. But if that's you, if you're trying to live the way of the world and the way of the church, I have to repeat the word that started verse 16. Repent. I don't want to see the fake hollering, wailing, wailing, crying, wallering around. All of that, just repent. Pick it up, whatever's bothering you, whatever you've been holding on to, pick it up with you, bring it to the altar, lay it down, turn around, and leave it. Don't leave it out there where you can pick it back up, leave it here where God can deal with it. Repent. Have a change of self, a change of heart, a change of mind. Walk a different path than what you walked when you come in. And I would encourage everyone to simply come and get at the feet of God. Get at the foot of the the throne or the foot of the cross, whichever you need to do. But I believe when you come to the foot of the throne is when you find grace and mercy. And can we not all use grace and mercy in these days that we're in? Friend, if you've not submitted your life to Christ, please come. Please, I beg of you. I don't do the closed eyes and hand raise and all that. I I don't have nothing against it. It's just not me. I don't do it. If you deny Christ before men, He's going to deny you before the Father. If you need saved, come up and get saved. Repent and turn around. For everyone else, I would just encourage you to come and get what you need from the Lord today. 